Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session in the third series of American English Live Teacher Development. My name is Lauren, and I'll be with you today along with my colleague behind the scenes, moderator Heather, who will be serving, we will be serving as moderators to help answer your questions and respond to your comments during the session. Today, Kate will be talking with Laura Becker about designing and leading impactful professional development for teachers. Let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. As Lauren said, I am Kate, and I work here in Washington, DC in the Office of English Language Programs. I'm part of the American English social media team, and I'm happy to be with you here as your facilitator today. We'd love to, ex uh, to extend a warm welcome to our first time viewers. If you're joining us for the very first time, We'd love for you to let us know in the comments. And of course, we're so happy to see all of you who have joined us before, and we're really glad that you are continuing to learn and share with us. So thanks for being with us. Let's start with these American English Live viewing group photos featuring teachers at the Lincoln Corner Skardu in Pakistan and Youth English Corner in Zanzibar. Special thank you to these viewing groups for sharing these photos. We love to see teachers learning and sharing together as they view the American English Live series. So thank you, and we'd love to see more. So please share your photos by emailing them to the email there on your screen, AmericanEnglishWebinars at ELprograms.org, or by tagging us on social media at American English for Educators, or by using the hashtag American English. We may feature one of your photos in the next session. So let's review our exciting lineup for this series. Our presentations for this series are on the topics of service learning, professional development for teacher trainers, and managing multi-level classrooms. Today, we're talking about professional development for teacher trainers. And we look forward to learning more about this and other topics without, uh, throughout the rest of the series. So here's a little bit about what to expect. Each session is about 60 minutes long, and it's usually linked to a teacher's corner theme on the American English website. Resources related to this event will be shared um, in the comments, and also the slides and recording will be on our American English website very soon. The presenter will present the material, and I, as your host, will ask questions and make comments as well. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. So please do share your questions and comments in the comment box or chat box. When our session comes to a close in about an hour, you will have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of this session, we will share a link in the comments and at the top of this post. Click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three questions correctly in order to receive the digital badge. But don't worry, the quiz is not too difficult. If you are here to join us for the entire hour, you should have no trouble filling it out. And also we will leave this link open until Monday, September 24th. So if you don't get a chance to watch the whole session, but you wanna review the materials, this recording will stay right where it is and you can watch it later and take the quiz later. You can only complete the quiz one time, so take your time, but don't worry too much. Once you have successfully passed the quiz, you should receive your um, email with your badge from AmericanEnglish at state.gov within about a week. And we are very pleased to announce that registration for the Professional Development for Teachers, Teacher Trainers MOOC, or Massive Open Online Course, is now open. Be sure to register today. This MOOC designed for both new and experienced teachers gives participants methods for creating, presenting, and evaluating effective teacher training workshops. You will gain tools and techniques for promoting and providing professional development in your teaching context. And if you earn 70% or higher on the, throughout this five-week course, you will receive a digital badge as well for your mark as a mark of completion. So you can see the link here. Be sure to register at www.aeeteacher.org slash MOOC. And you can see that course orientation begins October 10th and the course begins on October 15th. 
So we are excited to see you there. And now for today's session, which will be a little bit of um, hopefully a, a really nice taste or introduction to the topic of our MOOC, Designing and Leading Professional Development for Teachers. Have you ever thought of leading a professional development workshop for other teachers? Do you design teacher development activities and wonder how to make them as effective as possible? Well, today we will explore the core principles for planning teacher professional development. We will all learn how to design and lead an effective workshop along with several effective ongoing professional development practices. And we will consider keys to professional development success ranging from creating a community of teachers to selecting materials that will lead to intensive and purposeful interaction. And now it is my Delight and pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Laura Becker. Hello. Hi. Laura is an associate professor of TESOL at Hunter College at the University of New York. Her research relates to English as a second and as a foreign language teacher preparation, and she has over 50 publications <laughs> and books. Wow. Yeah. She is also the co-editor of The New Educator and serves on the editorial board of the TESOL Journal. Journal, excuse me. Laura has presented extensively internationally and in the US, and she also develops and directs study abroad programs for teachers. She has served as TESOL International's Teacher Education Interest Section Chair and as a US Department of State English Language Specialist and as a consultant to the New York City Public Schools. So welcome, Laura. We're so happy to have you here today. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here with everyone and really looking forward to hearing what your questions are and what your ideas are around leading your own professional development. So we'll just jump right in. Uh, today's session, um, I was thinking a lot about you out in many, many different contexts. And so I'm hoping that what we provide you today, um, there's something in it for you. So definitely be active with the comments and questions so that we can make sure to answer uh, and brainstorm with you. So the picture on the first slide um, you'll see is uh, a black chalkboard and some light bulbs, some wheels turning and a bar chart. So I selected this image because I thought it was a great way to think about the whole design process. Uh, and the light bulbs are great ideas in teaching English. There's so many different approaches and methods um, that we wanna share and learn and improve. And those are the ideas that go into teacher professional learning. But the wheels that turn, that's you that gets them in motion. All your colleagues working together, trying to explore and try out these new methods and the bar chart is the results, the impact on your students uh, as their English language hopefully improves and improves as you work through uh, all this new learning. So what I'd like to do is go uh, just share a little about what the goals are um, for today's session. Uh, the first goal is to just help you see some of the, um, the key components um, that we found from a lot of research that tell you what professional development will be effective. And the second goal is to give you a little feel for how it's different to work with teachers learning versus students learning and using all of that to make sure we have enough time to really look at some wonderful approaches that have been widely used um, in teacher professional learning. So getting started, um, I'd like to know, we can go to the next slide, what you think um, of when you think of teacher training and teacher development. Um, what do you think the difference is and which of those have you experienced? Um, and I'd love to hear some of the comments. All right, yeah, let's hear it from you, everyone. What do you think is the difference between teacher training and teacher development? And then what do you think you've experienced maybe more of? So as we're looking at our comments, we're getting a few 
coming in, but as we're looking at some of those and waiting for everybody to have a chance to think about it, I guess I think of training myself, Laura, as more of what I went through before I became a teacher and development as sort of how I maintain my skills and improve my skills as I go along my teaching career. Is that about right? Definitely. I think training, we think of as something when we're new to a craft or a trade that we work with someone who has expertise and they show us how to do this new thing and we do a lot of practice with it. That's sort of our training piece and they give us feedback on how we're doing. So development would be something more across the lifetime, across your career that never really ends. It's something that's ongoing learning. Great, right, yeah, it looks like Ignach Chimbote, hopefully I'm saying that correctly, he agrees that, that, that development is more ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, Pretty says that I think improving skills um, is part of development. Um, Fatima says that development is to improve our skills which already exist in us. Oh, I like that idea, nice. Um, Great. So a lot of great. Um, yeah, those are great ideas. ideas because the idea that it's already in us already, you know, so that leads us to the idea of working with other teachers in doing professional development. Um, why might we call the leader of a teacher professional development experience a facilitator and not call them a trainer? Great question. So we'd love to hear from you, everyone. Why, why would we call a professional development leader a facilitator rather than a trainer? What's the difference there and why would we call them a facilitator? Um, and it looks also like um, some other folks are talking about how teacher development is practical implementation of learning and um, development is practicing. So we have some other great definitions there as well. Those, those are great. And uh, I think when we think about um, putting something into practice, we, we really need someone to support us. We're doing that work. So it's not so much that uh, we need training, but we need someone to help guide us to just create the space and the time and the structure. And that's really more of a facilitator role. Right. Um, Noreen yeah. says that um, a facilitator just augments our learning. Uh, Nusrat says a facilitator guides us. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Um, Gaza, Gazla says that you can train a teacher, but development can be shown on his or her part through improvement. Mm -hmm. And Mercedes says that we call it a facilitator because they motivate us to do things on our own. I like that. I love that. And the, um, what, what those comments are making me think of is that the training is really what I'm doing to you, but the development is what you're doing within yourself. I can't make someone develop. Um, that's something that's going to be their own process. So all of those uh, elements, we wanna kind of keep in mind throughout this workshop that this is not the same as um, initial teacher education or teacher training, but something different. And it's really about working with colleagues and knowing that all of you as English teachers already have a lot to offer and share with each other. And it's really not about being an expert. It's about facilitating. And if you know how to teach, you know how to facilitate. Um, so let's take a look at kind of a definition for professional development. So you see, I have a who, what, where, when, why, you know, the five W's and the H. Um, so starting with the who, as I just mentioned, it can be led by teachers. It, it can be led by a coach. Uh, it can be led by an administrator, but it doesn't have to be um, someone who is in a position of authority. We can all share and lead professional development. When it can happen before school, during a lunch break, after school, um, anytime. Uh, where it can happen right in a classroom that's empty. It can happen in a ministry central office, or it can happen online like it is right now. Um, it doesn't have to be face to face. Um, how? The how is creating that opportunity for really meaningful interaction with other professionals. That interaction is the key to professional development. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is not 
me as an individual teacher, you know, reading and learning and of course, continuing to develop on my own. This is really about developing the, um, the, the way things are being taught in a school for the benefit of student learning. So I can't always do that on my own. Um, we want to build why new knowledge, new skills. There's so much out there in English language teaching that we want to try and improve and bring into our classrooms. And ultimately the what is teachers are learning. They're getting new knowledge and skills so that they can bring that to students and students will benefit. Wonderful. I love this slide because it's very teacher focused. When we are doing professional development, sometimes I think in, in some schools, you just kind of do, do a workshop or the school um, um, organizes a workshop just to organize a workshop. But this is really showing us that um, with professional development, we need to be focused on the teacher. Just like in our classrooms, we have to be student centered. Um, with professional development, we really need to be teacher centered. So where is best for them to meet? What skills do they need to develop? Um, can they lead or can they help lead some of these uh, workshops? So I really like the concepts that you're sharing with us here. Absolutely, absolutely. Because we know as uh, English language teachers, we have to, when we're planning lessons, we're thinking about what are the students doing in the lesson? And when we plan teacher learning, in professional development, we have to think also, what will the teachers be doing? It's not just a, a delivery, they have to engage actively. So let's take a look a little more um, on the next slide. And we're gonna go to sometimes when we don't feel professional <laughs> development is really exciting or engaging us. Um, so these are three pictures from a teacher who's gone to a professional development, maybe she wasn't so thrilled with, <laughs> um, we've all had those experiences, we have to be honest, and we can learn a lot from them. So if you would take a moment and give me an adjective, a feeling uh, for each of those three teachers, she's in the professional development, what do you think she is feeling? Yeah, let's, um, let us know participants in the comments and in the chat box, how do you think this teacher here is feeling while she's sitting in a professional development um, event. Looks like Olfa says anxious. Hmm. March, March says um, she's sleeping or maybe very <laughs> falling asleep. <laughs> um, Myra says she's bored and maybe she's thinking that there's nothing new for her. That's a good hmm. point. Oh, um, let's see. Crystal says she doesn't seem interested at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. So yeah. Oh yeah, so those are right on point. Um, frustrated. Okay, so let's look at um, the yes, next and slide. Aisha, Aisha says, I've had these expressions too. <laughs> <laughs> Good, we all have. And it's important to look at the non-examples so we can look for the examples. Mm -hmm. So um, these are just along the lines of, of what you are writing. Um, I'm already familiar with these techniques. There's nothing really here for me. Um, the teacher who's falling asleep, you know, I, I can't just sit here and be lectured to. I've taught all day. I'm busy. Get me active. Um, and that hopefully might lead you to feel the third teacher, which is, you know what? I could lead this professional development. I know as much as this presenter does. Um, mm -hmm. Give me a chance. So going to the next slide, um, if you would take a second to think about why do those teachers get to feeling frustrated, bored, uh, et cetera. Um, what have you seen or experienced or what do you think might have led them to feel that way? So if you can complete this sentence, teacher professional development may not be so effective when? All right, great. So when would teacher professional development not be effective or when would you maybe feel uh, the way that those pictures kind of um, depicted. So what are some examples or things that have happened for you in professional development maybe that weren't so effective? Let's see. A lot of people saying they can relate. <laughs> I think one thing is um, when it has no relevance for my classroom or I really don't feel that it's appropriate for my context, I often feel like the, the woman in those photos. Mm -hmm. um, Benish says teachers are not 
uh, I'm sorry, Aisha says that maybe um, the, they don't feel that they're being active mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're not being asked to be engaged in the process. Um, Gasala says it doesn't, it doesn't engage the teacher personally. Mm. One. Or Katrina, I think this is one we can all relate to. The teacher has already heard that information before. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, and so that's why your interaction is really important because when, um, when we are sharing these ideas, we want to make sure you jump in and make, you know, sometimes make the professional development meaning for yourself. Um, so let's take a look at the next slide, which is what a lot of research uh, on professional development has found. Um, when it's not effective, teachers don't take up the learning, they don't implement the new method, and students don't benefit. Um, so it's really important to understand what happens here that wasn't so effective. First of all, as you said, the participants do not get to choose what the content is. Someone tells them, you're going to learn this. Well, maybe I have no interest in that, or maybe I already know that. Um, the second bullet that the facilitator does a lot of talking and you don't get a chance to talk to your colleagues. It's just really listening. Um, the facilitator sometimes doesn't seem to have a lot of experience or they don't have experience in your school and your context. So it doesn't always make sense what they're suggesting. Um, sometimes it's not effective because it's not differentiated you know it's like everybody's a new teacher but you have experience maybe in the room and the last one happens a lot way too much which is that after the workshop after the professional development session or experience there's no follow-up you never hear from the facilitator again you don't get to talk to other participants see how it's going for them so some of the um, suggestions we have today are to kind of get at that piece. Um, so these are some of the ineffective approaches and a lot of you noticed why um, the teachers are looking that way. These are the reasons behind that. And so let's take a look um, on the next slide at the positive. All so, right, right. so we so we took a, we kind of reflected on some um, aspects of professional development in the past that maybe weren't so effective. And now we get to see this beautiful, bright bowl of seven principles that are gonna be effective for us. Yes, because um, it's, a, it's really, uh, there's so much great professional development that we've all experienced too. We've gone to workshops that we just hold that material for years because it was so great and so useful or just an experience, or even just getting to know colleagues, it re-energizes. We leave feeling really good and excited about teaching. So I'm gonna walk through these principles, just touch on them. These are all based on a lot, about 25 years of big, large-scale research on English language teachers around the world. Um, but please jump in anytime, any comments or questions as we go. Um, so I'm gonna to go to the next slide and walk you through them. The first one is that the professional development really connects to student learning. And so if the method, let's say it's a new approach to teaching pronunciation, I wanna know, is that a proven method? Is that a method there's been some research on? Because I want to take time, take teachers time, only on methods that are really going to impact student learning. The second um, component or principle is that what you all mentioned before, that the teacher has some um, involvement, has some goals that they have for their teaching and that you check in with them with a survey, a questionnaire, talking to teachers. So what you choose to present is really related to what they wanna learn more about. Absolutely. Yeah, this is definitely one that a lot of our participants, I think, were bringing up in our previous discussion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, the next item is uh, that the whatever the professional development is about, 
it's something teachers can really use in the classroom. Um, it, it has examples of how it's been used um, so that it's not something that's, again, oh, it sounds great. It's a great activity, but it can never work, you know, where I am. Um, you want to hear and work with things that you feel you, you could really use in your setting, even if you have to adapt it a little bit. Uh, the next important feature of effective professional development is that as the facilitator presents the ideas, they give participants a chance to really practice the ideas. So if the professional development says, hey, we need to do more pair work in classrooms, the professional development workshop has pair work in it. You want to actually engage in the doing of the method because it helps you really understand it and you're more likely to use it back in your classroom when you've done it yourself. Absolutely. This one kind of ties in a couple things like actually implementing, but also during the workshop being an active participant, which a lot of people also brought up. Absolutely. The next um, component is that afterwards, there's some follow-up. So in order to have follow-up, I need to make sure the administration supports what we're doing. If a supervisor or inspector comes to watch the teaching, they'll say, yes, this is the methods that we want to see. There'll be encouragement. Or even it's just that the group comes back together and says, how's it going? What, how is this new method working out? So there's support over time. The next um, point, is that there's a peer group that's created um, that when we have been teaching something a certain way for a long time, it can be really hard to try something new and the support and the encouragement of our colleagues is really, really essential. And that schools uh, and teachers where there is this community and interchange um, is going on, it really impacts the student learning experience. That's great. And actually, I think this might be a good place for a question we had from Saima. Um, she asks, um, it's sort of related to a previous point you were making, Laura, but she yeah. asks, what if teachers have different needs? How do you address different needs of participants? Because we want to focus on their needs, but what if there are lots of different ones? Great question. <laughs> that, that is a great question. And we get that a lot when we teach. You know, we have multi-level classes and we are teaching this intermediate English language text, but we've got students at different levels. So we use a lot of what we know from language teaching, which is we need to somehow differentiate or tier the tasks. So for example, let's say that, uh, let's go back to the pronunciation example. There's a new method in teaching pronunciation, but you find out that a couple of teachers in that room are really experts on pronunciation. They've done a lot of that work. Could they become co-facilitators? Could they help share some of the practices that they have engaged in? Um, can you somehow group people during the session or pair them so people with different areas of strengths can share it? Because just acknowledging, hey, you, you know a lot about this, can really help teachers feel good and proud of their craft. And they're going to become your ally, your support, your friend as you present as mm -hmm. instead of, well, I know this, you know, uh, I'm pushed back. So you want to find out what people already know and do uh, before you design the workshop, before you engage everyone. Thank you. I think that's a great answer. Thanks, Laura. And I think um, it kind of highlights the fact that differentiation is similar when you're um, working with groups of teachers or with students. And you can maybe ask teachers to be leaders where they are experts um, and that you can kind of focus in on all the different types of needs and maybe address them at different times. So thanks for that great. Yeah. That's, no, that is such a great question. And I think sometimes when we differentiate for our language learners, we don't think about doing it for teachers. Um, and it could, it could also just be a different material. So they're working in different ways at the same goal. Um, but the peer support is, is definitely a big component of the learning. Um, and let's go on to the last um, one that's often overlooked. Um, but that is, what is the impact on the teaching? How did that professional development change something 
how did it innovate or change the system? And it can be very small changes. Um, so for example, this workshop that we're doing right now online through American English, I would love to hear if you wind up trying to do some professional development work um, on your own or with a colleague um, in the next couple of months, we'd love to hear more about that because that will help me know, hey, something that I offered was taken up and you're free to you know, send me a, a friend request on Facebook, anything, I would love to interact with you afterwards to find out how it's going for you and see the impact. Yes, definitely. And of course, I'm going to put a plug in here for um, your photos, guys. So if there's something from this um, webinar that you really resonated with and you want to put something into practice, we'd love to see your photos. You can send them to American English webinars at elprograms.org or tag us um, at American English for Educators on social media. We'd love to see how you're implementing these great ideas. Absolutely. So let's look now at all the seven uh, components put together and give you a chance to reflect. So these were the seven principles based on a lot of research of what makes professional development for teachers effective. So which of these do you think is really important or essential? Yeah, what do you guys think? Which of these is the most important of the seven principles? We'd love to hear from you. Is it connecting to student learning outcomes or that the professional development is based on per personal and professional goals? What do you think, participants, is the most important out of these seven? Let's see, Ifat says it's important that it be refreshing and informative. Mm -hmm. um, reflection, oh, it looks like Miriam thinks that one, five, and seven are all important. Um, let's see, Alexander says that number five, Katrina number six, which is involving the collective participation of peers. Mm -hmm. Myra thinks that one, three, and six are some of the most important ones. It looks like we've got a lot of variation where a lot of people are choosing different principles. Maybe they're all really important. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are all really important. And at the end of this presentation, there is a... Um, a document that takes all of them and gives you some thought questions as you design your own professional development. And I mean, it is hard to always be able to do all of these things, but they're good to keep in mind. And for sure, um, the ongoing implementation support, without that, doesn't matter how fantastic the workshop is, in general, teachers forget and they don't really start to implement. Um, so I, I agree um, with people who've chosen number five. So some of the uh, practical uh, ideas that we're gonna share in this presentation really get at ongoing. Um, okay, so we know a lot about professional development, what makes it effective, but let's look inside a little more at who teachers are as learners. So um, what do you think are some differences between the way teachers might learn and the way students learn? Because teaching teachers is kind of its whole other area. Yeah, this is a really good question. What do you, what does everyone think? What do our participants think? Um, what's the difference between how teachers learn and how students learn? And as we're waiting for some responses, one thing that comes to my mind is in general, teachers are older than students. <laughs> at, least, <laughs> at least that's how I'm framing it now. That's not always the case. Right. But, um, and so I often think of adults or, or people who are a little older, that they have a lot of experience that they bring to the table. Um, definitely. Definitely. Let's and, see. Um, yeah. yeah, let's see. Eigel says that teachers are excellent learners. <laughs> um, and maybe Louis, Louis says that maybe the difference is be, uh, between the focus and the goals of what, what students are in the room for and what teachers are in the room for. Mm, definitely. Let's see. Um, lots of people saying things like teachers are lifelong learners. That's very true. That's why we all chose this profession, I think. We all love to learn. Yes, absolutely. Um, Akilara, Akilaria says that teachers' expectations can sometimes be a little bit um, higher. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of great, lot of great ideas, guys. Thank you for sharing. 
Um, and also Elena says that teachers have more previous knowledge. I think that's a big key point as well. Absolutely. Um, teachers are learners. Teachers are bringing a lot of experience. All of the points that you made are right on. Um, let's take a look at um, some of the ideas that come from a field of study called adult learning. Um, and it relates to teacher learning because, of course, teachers are uh, we're talking about adult teachers, but as you said, Kate, we, we teach adults. So sometimes we have English learner students who are older than us, but yet it's a different environment. So if I'm going into my classroom to teach English, that's a really different um, kind of planning process and uh, experience for me than it is when I go to work with a teacher group. So remember we use the word facilitator. Um, we think about working with teacher groups. And like uh, a lot of the comments uh, suggested, we know that teachers have a lot of experience. They have life experience, professional experience. We want to build on that experience. Um, it's not that we are teaching something brand new. Uh, we're teaching, you know, uh, the past progressive and the students don't know it. It's tabula rasa. They're, they're ready to learn it. Well, no, the kinds of things we're teaching teachers, they have some experience already. Um, the second bullet is that remember teachers, because they're with their peers, they might feel, um, oh, I have to be an expert at this, or I shouldn't share my opinion, or maybe my English, I'm a little nervous to actually say my opinion about the teaching idea because I'm doing it through my second language. So teachers sometimes can feel very vulnerable and unsure actually in a learning situation. That's why that's that, true. Yeah, I think, and I think sometimes, I think, you know, sometimes when people feel a little insecure, they might um, either share a lot or not share very much at all. They might consider that, oh, I better share all the things that I'm doing so that I look like an expert, or they might on the other side of it think, I'm not an expert. I don't have anything to share. Um, and so I think that's a really good point to make is there's even, even with groups of teachers, sometimes you feel a little bit shy or a little bit insecure in a profession. Yeah, and especially in a lot of places where a teacher who is a more uh, veteran, more years of teaching, um, will get authority in the room and a newer teacher might feel afraid to say something. Um, they want to save face or they want to show respect to the more experienced teacher. So those are things that can be challenging and why you wanna really think about the third bullet, which is, doing activities that create a sense of safety, that we're here to explore, um, that there's not a right answer. There's a lot of ways to teach the past progressive that can all be successful. So it's really about reflecting on what we do, what we'd like to do better, um, but that we have to sometimes challenge some strong beliefs that teachers have about practice. So that's why we want to have um, a lot of engagement so teachers can really play with um, some new ideas. So let's take a look at um, some of those new ideas uh, and some are familiar ideas. Uh, these are five types of professional development. I'm starting with the workshop because we are so familiar with workshop and we think of workshop when we think of teacher professional development, uh, but there's some other ways as well. So let's jump into the workshop first. The first, the first uh, one is what we call a turnkey, uh, which is that you might watch a great session on American English and it's on um, bringing culture into the classroom. And you say, gee, this is really great. I want to talk about this more and share this. Um, so it can be a great way to bring in a new idea um, and you're taking on a leadership role, but you don't have to invent all the content. There's a lot of content that's already out there. Um, so let's take a look at the steps. So the steps involved for the workshop. First of all, you're going to want to ask teachers what they want to learn about. Choose a focus from their responses. When you have the teachers together, icebreaker, icebreaker, icebreaker. Sometimes we forget to do that. We, oh, these teachers know each other. Uh, or they just want to get to the material. No, they really want to get to know each other. And they're going to feel more comfortable and share more 
if you can set up a lot of getting to know you. And we know we're experts at those in English language teaching. Mm -hmm. um, it gives you a chance to feel out the audience, who they are. Um, then the method that you want to bring in, let's say um, these are teachers who work with young learners and you want to show them some new games to work with young learners do the games. Yes, we feel a little silly sometimes. And you can say, I know you're not little kids. We're teachers, but I'm doing this because, and they'll get involved. They'll do the method, but then they'll step out of it as teachers and discuss, well, how did you think that went? How could you implement it? Plan the follow-up so that you know when I'm going to try this new method, when we're going to come back together and talk about it or share it, and then evaluate what's happening in the classroom that's different than before. So let's look at just some tips. Uh, so some of the tips, start with volunteers. You know, you don't wanna force people to go to a workshop. Um, share something that you love, that you know very well, that you're excited about sharing with other teachers. Don't forget to bring some food, put on some fun music in the background, because as teachers, we also need to, you know, be picked up sometimes um, and have something feel fun and joyful. Um, remember to plan. A workshop um, has to be planned just as much as a lesson. Just because they're adults, they're teachers, they're not going to start to run around the room. Um, you want to make sure that every part of your time is well planned. And if you do have a very big audience, 200 teachers, um, make sure to always break them up into smaller groups with leaders so that they can really interact. Finally, let's see. I think yeah. a lot of, I think a lot of people love the third point here, the music and food aspect, <laughs> which I think Absolutely. is actually a really good point. You know, it's one way to build community and make people feel comfortable. Absolutely. Uh, and the last um, slide from, for looking at this approach um, is the next one which is just a, a, a picture of some teachers who decided to look more at their content and language instruction. So they say, you know what? I really do wanna do more content with my language teaching. I saw the American English a session on this. Um, this is what I'm gonna now turn around and try to share. And it may not be a one day experience. It could be a workshop that continues over several sessions. So let me ask everyone to just have a chance to reflect on the workshop and ask any questions. So um, we'll go to that slide and see if you have any questions about the approach or challenges you think um, when you're thinking about planning a workshop. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. What questions do you have about trying this approach and what challenges might you face and how might you address those challenges? Um, let's see. I, I really like also about this approach that we're asking for volunteers to start. So we're not just making people um, do this, but people who really are interested and invested are going to be attending. I think that would help a lot. Um, Shumila says that she really likes the idea of breaking teachers into groups. Um, yeah, there's one asked about yeah. the budget for this. Uh-huh. <laughs> Very practical question. <laughs> well, that is a great question. And uh, like most teaching, uh, we bring in our food from home and we uh, bring in the music. And hopefully most of what you'll need is uh, it's, it's a, a currency of ideas. It's not that you have to give people materials, books. Um, it's that you're getting them to engage in a thinking process. So there might be a text, there might be a video, there might be um, some materials that you'll have uh, on a presentation, on a PowerPoint or on a piece of paper, but the workshop should not cost much. Um, now, in terms of teachers getting paid to attend, that's another story. Yeah, that's um, a whole for sure. I mean, what you <laughs> mentioned, Kate, and um, some of the audience about the choice uh, and the groups. So one way to go about getting volunteers is to say, in some schools, what they'll do is say, all the teachers need to choose um, three professional developments in this semester or this year or whatever. And this is the menu. So teachers know they have to attend, but they get to choose from within that topics that they'd like to do. So that's one way to handle that. Yeah, choice is always great for teachers or for students. And um, just one other quick comment from this is that Alexander said that um, 
technology can sometimes be an issue, but it, a solution he gave us was to always have a backup plan. So <laughs> yes, yes, and uh, you'll want to make sure that again, if the workshop relies a lot on technology. Why is that? You know, it, is, the t is there enough time really for teacher dialogue? Because that's gonna be the heart of the work inside a workshop. Right. Okay. Right. Let's look at the next one. This one's really easy to implement. Um, it can be a great way just to begin to create a learning community. So in the United States, we talk about bringing a brown bag to work although now we have fancy insulated bags, we don't use brown bags so much, but there's a common expression of a brown bag group. And in a brown bag group, you bring together teachers. So let's take a look at the steps. Um, you invite them, say, hey, who's interested in this topic? Um, you find a time, you make a calendar. We're gonna meet for lunch. We're gonna bring our lunch together every Wednesday or one Wednesday a month, et cetera we choose a facilitator, you know, this month I'll go, next month, Kate, you're gonna facilitate. And the facilitator, like a book club, chooses the focus. They find a text, short, not a whole book, you know, a text, a reading, maybe one of the videos from a Facebook Live event from American English, something everyone's gonna watch or read. And then we come together and the facilitator has a few questions to get everyone started and sharing and thinking. And there's a discussion and that's it. It can be done in 45 minutes um, and it can be a great way to sort of to start to break the ice. So let's take a look at some tips. Try inviting people you don't know. Put a flyer in a whole bunch of teachers boxes um, because that's a way to in, just create more of a community. Um, remember that when you're in the brown bag group, Still, even if it's a group of five or six people, it's better to let people have a chance to turn and talk to a partner and then turn back to the group so they have more chance, especially if they're a little shy about sharing their ideas. Um, and remember that the conversation, even the reading or the video does not have to be in English. The idea is that we're getting people comfortable talking about teaching and then later implementing, of course, in the English language teaching context. So the and, next, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm just going to say that I love this idea. And I think I like the idea that it doesn't necessarily have to be in English. It's always nice, I guess, if it could be. But like you said before, sometimes if someone feels a little bit shyer, the idea is that the teaching method itself is what they're discussing and thinking about. So I like that. Right, because these are working teachers. They're already employed. You don't need to assess their English skills per se. It's a nice chance to practice English if people are comfortable with it. But sometimes it's teachers are more worried about their English than about the content or the ideas. So you want to make sure people feel comfortable to share in any of the languages they know. Mm -hmm. um, the next slide shows you um, an example of teachers using an empty classroom Deciding on the topic, which was culture, they used the American English Live session as their reading, and they're actually going to meet several times, um, continuing to talk about culture in the classroom over a whole semester. So they meet every couple of weeks, bring their lunch, and talk about what they're doing. So that's a nice way to implement or continue a topic over time as well. So I'm curious what people think about this approach. Yes, I'm curious to hear what you think about this approach too. I saw a lot of people saying, I think Noreen said, I want to try this tomorrow. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. That's great. So I think a lot of people, um, Samina says this is a great way to get professionals together. So let's let's move on just because yes. sadly we're running out of time. Oh man. So I want to make sure we have enough time for okay. all the ideas. <laughs> so the next one is peer coaching. So let's look at the steps involved in peer coaching, which is a way to open up your classroom doors. Um, so let's look at the steps involved in that. And you need to find a partner, a teacher partner, decide what you wanna work on in your teaching. It can be different, it could be the same goal. You're gonna take a chance to observe each other. It doesn't have to be the whole time, it could be 20 minutes of observation. Come back together, share what you found and do it again. So let's look at some tips with that. Um, doesn't have to be a lot of people involved. You wanna make sure what you're gonna look at is really clear 
You don't want to judge. It's not about supervision or evaluation of the whole lesson. It's examining or exploring teaching. You can also bring together teachers who you do this. You're a great writing teacher. I'm a great teacher of speaking. Let's look at each other's practice. Mm -hmm. So going to the next uh, image here, um, we all are working on teacher talk. You know, we do too much teacher talk. How do we get more student talk? So these teachers decided to focus on teacher talk over a whole semester. They went back and forth looking at how they were um, trying to build up more student language use in the classroom, because these are not things that happen quick. These are things that take time, but by keeping the focus and knowing you and I are in it together, we're both working towards this goal. It keeps the goal really in mind because yeah, you're a little nervous because your colleagues coming in, but it keeps you tracked. It keeps you targeting that thing, that new method, as opposed to kind of forgetting about it, putting it to the side. So any thoughts on peer coaching? You're welcome to share. Yeah, so can you explain um, the, the clear difference between the brown bag session and the peer coaching session? How would you distinguish those two? Well, the brown bag session is um, not, it does not involve classroom observation. Uh -huh. That is bringing in ideas for reading. So it's almost like a study group. So we're continuing to learn about teaching and we're having conversations, but it's not yet I'm going into your classroom now to look at how you're doing that because that's kind of a next step. Gotcha. Yeah. And Sala says about peer coaching that this helps us to fill in the blanks of each other. I think he might be referring to your example of one person's really good yes. at teaching writing and the other one's good at teaching speaking. We can help yeah. each other to build off of our strengths and support each other in some areas where we still need to develop. Absolutely. And teachers, you know, we all are very hard on ourselves. We're always looking for things we could do better. And sometimes it can be a, a nice form of support to really celebrate things that we each are doing in our classrooms. Yeah. One, um, let's see, Abdullah Musa says, in peer coaching, will some teachers feel like you want to pick on them? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is why peer coaching is something you're going to have to build up to. Uh, I would suggest doing that after the workshop or mm -hmm. after the brown bags, when you have a feeling of comfort and that we're there in it together. And it, again, voluntary. Um, you also wanna do some work on evaluative versus descriptive notes mm -hmm. so that the um, colleague is writing just what they see in here and not putting in their judgments. Great, and Arno Paul says that this allows for the experienced teachers to teach the new teachers and vice versa. Yeah, so. and I love the vice versa. Um, because when we think of experienced teachers doing coaching, it's really a mentoring relationship. But mm -hmm. a peer is the idea that we are somehow equal. Um, but yes, we're not always equal because someone has a lot more experience than us, but maybe we're really good in technology and the mm -hmm. veteran teacher would like to see how to work in more technology. So we always have something to offer each other. Yeah, great. Okay, and learning walks, which is the next uh, approach, is um, another kind of form of um, observation. It, it's a way to discover more about how that new method is getting uh, worked on or enacted in classrooms. So let's look at the steps involved with that. In this case, a few people, let's say there's a group of five of us, we're all gonna participate. On one day, you all, all four of you come in and look at my classroom. You're looking for evidence of a particular practice. Um, maybe it's how much are my students producing English? And you take notes, you spread out around the room, you don't stand at the wall, you get evidence, you don't stay more than about 15 minutes. You leave, have a conversation, what did we find? Um, and we hold that data and then we do the next cycle. So one learning walk should only take about 45 minutes during the teaching um, day. Uh, so some tips with learning walks. Um, going to the next slide. Again, volunteer-based. Want to make sure that the notes we're taking are not judgmental, that we know what we're looking for, because we don't want people observing everything and giving us all this feedback about things that was not the focus. So we, if we're focusing on student language production, that's the notes we're taking. Um, so let's take a look at an example. So these teachers have said, hey, we want to look at 
are the students producing enough English language in the classrooms? They seem to be using so much of their native language. They're not using enough English. Let, let us look at this. We all want to work on this. So um, this is another kind of form of peer coaching, but a little bit more uh, structured with more participants. So I'd love to know any thoughts on learning walks, any questions people have. Yeah, what questions do you have about learning walks and what challenges do you think you might face or how would you address those challenges when it comes to learning walks? You know, one thing I really like about all of these approaches is the seek volunteers component. <laughs> yeah. I think it's yeah. important to note that because the other thing too is once you get a small group of volunteers, maybe other teachers in the school will see the exciting things that are happening with that group and they might Maybe they were reluctant at first, but now they want to participate in it. Absolutely. As well. They see there's an excitement and energy, and they're going to want to become part of it. Maybe at the first, they were a little unsure about it. And if you're new at creating and implementing a professional development, you, you want people who want to be there because you will need that support as you're learning to be a facilitator. Um, so the last approach. Oh, and one other is that Noreen. Mursa says that teachers need to learn coaching skills too, and this might really help them to develop those. Yes. Coaching skills. Yes. So a lot of teachers have a lot of experience and they're getting a little tired. They want to kind of move themselves into a teacher leader role. And this is a nice way for them to gain that experience. It's something you can put on your resume, you know, that you have been a peer coach that makes you stand out as well. Um, so this last one is called lesson study. It's been around for a while. It comes from Japan. And the idea is the professional development happens around lesson planning. So let's take a look at the steps involved in lesson study. Uh, a group of teachers who all teach the same, let's say English level, work with the same textbook, teach the same lesson. Let's go back to our past progressives struggle to how do I, how do you teach it? How do I teach it? The group designs one lesson plan together. Then they go out, they each teach it, they observe each other, and they come back in with what they noticed, refining the lesson plan, and they can repeat the process. So some of the tips involved with lesson study. Um, this is great for experienced teachers. A lot of times highly experienced teachers are a little nervous about people watching them teach. Maybe they never really had that experience in training. It's been a long time. Novice teachers have been watched more recently. So they're not as um, anxious sometimes. But experienced teachers, when you invite them to use a lesson, they can feel more comfortable with doing the analysis of lesson planning. And inside that conversation about the plan, the lesson plan, that's where the professional development is because they're so used to teaching and planning by themselves that okay. just sharing the planning process can be really new. Um, the, uh, the last slide here talks um, or just shows you a little about sometimes complicated activities like doing a jigsaw activity and reading. That can be hard to plan it. Exactly what, what is group A doing Okay, and then they switch and then they switch back, you know. Mm -hmm. So really getting to the detail with the planning in a group process can be really productive as professional development as well. So um, those are some of the techniques, um, approaches to professional development. And so let's take a look at, of those five, um, so we'll go to the next slide there. Yeah, perfect. The workshop, the brown bag, the peer coaching, the learning walk, the lesson study. What is exciting to you? What do you think you might like to try to facilitate? Yeah, let's hear from you guys. Which of the, these five ideas would be something that you would want to implement? And um, one thing that I'm thinking when I'm looking at this, it might depend on how much professional development you're already doing. It might be nice to start with something small or start with something that seems a little bit like a smaller amount of work at first. And then you can build on that and sort of flow into other ones. So let's see. Anita says that she likes um, number one, workshop or turnkey. Mario says workshops and brown bag or two. I see a couple of others. Saba is number one and two as well. 
Mm -hmm. Teresa likes learning walks. Another, uh, Saima says brown bag study group. Mm -hmm. And Zahid says all of these are quite helpful. Yeah. <laughs> a Absolutely. lot of ones and twos, a couple of twos and threes. So I, I noticed, I think it's Lizzie who said that um, the first couple of approaches, the workshop and the brown bag are kind of great introduction to a method talking about it, thinking about it. Whereas three, four, and five can be more on the implementation side, really addressing challenges with implementing that idea that got presented back in the workshop or the brown bag. Great. Yeah, I think like a few people were saying, I think um, we're gonna, we'll see a lot of these being implemented in schools. And like I've said a few times, we'd love to see how you're implementing these. So if you'd like to share, feel free to send us an email or tag us on social media. Wonderful. This last slide is, I mentioned earlier, uh, something you can print off and use when you're getting ready to plan that um, workshop, that brown bag, or that learning walk. So this can be a tool to uh, you as a, a new facilitator designer of professional development. Make sure to think through the questions and uh, do that in the design process. And then like Kate said, let me know if I can help. Let us know what you're doing with professional development. It's a great new step for you as a teacher to begin to help support other teachers in your community as they advance in their learning. So I wish you luck with it. Wonderful, thank you so much, Laura. Um, such great response. And I think um, a lot of our audience truly appreciated the framework you offered for becoming even more um, effective in professional development workshops. I think we all got a lot of really concrete ideas for how we can implement these in our schools. So thank you so very much.